It's time to beat the street with me, David Plimpton. <clears throat> well, hello friends and welcome back to this, the latest episode in my podcast series, Meet the Street. It's great to have you all back here in my virtual living room and as you know by now, the usual plan of attack is to start the show with a rundown of some of the things that I've been up to this week in the part of the programme I call What I've Been Up To This Week. What I've Been Up To This Week. Well, it seems spring is in the air here in the UK and we've been lucky enough to experience some splendid weather, which means that Jill and I have been able to get out and about on a few fantastic day trips, one of which was to the wonderful village of Staunton Lick, which is just a few miles down the road from here and it's a delight. Wonderful architecture, great scenery and some cracking walks. Even with the knee problems, Jill was champing at the bit to get out there and get stuck in. Even more so when we came across a wonderful example of some 11th century architecture in the form of St Rupert's Church, which is just on the edge of the village and proved a delight to spend the afternoon roaming around. Now, it would have been wonderful to speak to the vicar, but after a bit of a chat with the locals... It emerged he's currently under an investigation regarding misappropriation of church funds, which I'm sure will all come out in the wash eventually. Anyway, hang on. It's not right. Yeah, she's actually doing it. Unbelievable. Sorry about this. That's Jill, my wife. She's decided to single-handedly replace the downstairs kitchen window. Said getting someone in is far too expensive. 77 years old. She knew I was doing this. I swear she does these things on purpose. God's sake. Any... Anyway, I did get to speak with a very kindly man by the name of Michael Bent, who was putting up a promotional poster for a rather interesting event that's being held at the church hall next month. That's right, St Rupert's its host... That's right, St Rupert's is hosting its very own British Bulldogs Training Academy. And if you think you've got what it takes, then get ready for the sporting renaissance that's going to take the country by storm. Now, if you're not sure what British Bulldogs is, then fear not, because I've wangled an in-depth chat with the brains behind the whole scheme, Don Perrett. A man so passionate about this underground sport, he's waited over 20... She's banging now. He's waited over 20 years to kick-start this resurgence, into one of the United Kingdom's most treasured sporting activities. In this interview, he talks candidly about his career as one of the unsung heroes of the bulldog scene, how bureaucrats in Europe nearly put an end to one of the most culturally... one of the most culturally relevant past pastimes in Great Britain since since conquers, and how, with the right people behind him, Don could be the person responsible for a revolution in indoor sporting events. At this point, I would normally say sit back, relax and pour yourself a cup of tea, but with that racket going on, it doesn't make any sense at all. I'll, I can't think of anything else to say. I'll just press, pl- I'll just press play on it. It's, a, it's an interview about uh, British Bulldogs. Perrett, can you hear me, Don? Loud and clear, Dave. Loud and clear. Wonderful to speak to you. We haven't actually met before. Um, I was introduced to you via a mutual friend of ours by the name of Michael Bent. Big Mike. He was posting some of the um, uh, publicity posters for your new British Bulldogs training camp next month in St. Rupert's Church. Um, Don, before we go any further, could you just tell us what exactly British Bulldogs is? British Bulldogs is a 
slice, if you will, of British culture and history wrapped up in uh, a sport, a game, a way of life. Essentially, it's two teams of up to 100 men running across a field towards each other. The aim of the game to get to the other side of the field yeah. and back again without being struck by your opponent. And if you are struck, you then join the opposing team's force. Is yes. that you become you become a pursuer. You go from you go from the fox to the basset hound, but it's called bulldogs. It's a uniquely British sport. Well, I think all sports are really uh, football, rugby, tennis, snooker, darts, basketball, uh, skiing, ice skating, scuba diving, Australian rules football, American football, yeah, corfball, which they play in Scandinavia. Badminton, obviously, the horse trials, but also the, the game. Yeah. Swimming, we started swimming. Before the British invented swimming, people would regularly drown. Running, walking, boxing, you know, the rest, is, as they say, is history. It's history. And and again, for, for someone who doesn't quite know the sport, there's no ball, there's no, um, there are no Don't sticks, there are no Don't horses. Need a ball. It's just a conflict-based game, which can be enjoyed by people from the age of two to 102. How did you start off with the game? Where did you begin? So I started playing like a lot of kids in uh, in primary school. I had a great, great time doing it. The teachers were more than happy for us to do that every break time, lunchtime. And that continued on through the early part of secondary school. And then, of course, bloody the Europeans started uh, putting their fingers in our pie. Well, I clearly remember in the early 2000s, mm. um, there was a claim that Conkers was to be banned around the oh. country. And this... This led on to the demise of, of the uh, British Bulldog scene. Uh, it was driven underground, as far as I, I, I can tell. I said at the time, Dave, I said, Conkers are the thin end of the wedge. If, if we take away Conkers from kids and kids can no longer play Conkers and get bits of Conkers shot in their eyes, then what are we teaching our kids about life? After that happened, the right was on the wall. And I told people, they said they would never be able to stop British Bulldogs. But lo and behold, I'm not going to get into political debates, but certain nefarious influences in our parliament that were in in cahoots with their European brothers and sisters. Next thing you know, the mandate's passed and there's no more British Bulldogs being played. So all the great British sports, bear baiting, badger baiting, fox hunting, cock fighting, dog fighting, conkers, and of course, British Bulldogs join that list of just the, the cultural rape of our country, really, you know. Yeah, yeah. Almost illegally, you've kept the sport going. It's great to see that you've kept the spirit alive and, and you've yeah. gone public, essentially, with this now. Yeah. You, you've come out from the underground after years years surviving in the world. I refuse to bow to Brussels for a second longer. Because, of course, we know we've, we fought two wars against Europe, and we won both those. My grandfather, before me, uh, was a very keen cockfighter. The first parrot that I've traced from the 1600s in, um, in Stowe on the Wold was a bear baiter. Yeah. Uh, so myself and some like-minded uh, friends of mine, we think this is the best way that we can give two fingers to uh, to Europe. The time has come for us to stand as a country again, proudly. And I, I'm hoping this is just the start of the snowball. I'm hoping it's going to keep rolling. Obviously, we can see the appeal. And you're starting at a very grassroots level, trying to bring it back at, at, um, mm. at St. Rupert's Church. The first Wednesday of every month until we get the numbers up and then... We're hoping to go to twice a month. And then if the numbers go down again through injuries, we'll go back to once a month. The aim of the game, obviously, is to run from one side of the pitch to the other and make it to the other side without yeah. being intercepted. Or interfered with. Or, or to be interfered, depending on what school you played the sport in. Are there any specific moves or, or any specific styles in the actual game you could tell us about? There's the... Um, the tricky, tricky special, I call it, which is basically I would run towards you and pretend to fall. And as you go to help me up, then I bring the elbow up into, under your chin and then just run right over you, literally right over you. Keep going. Yeah. I've developed a move on my own, which is I would run towards you and kick you and then punch you. And there's the uh, the nutmeg, which is if I was approaching you, Dave, and you were standing legs akimbo like Henry VIII, trying to make yourself a wide barrier, then it would be the sl feet first slide under your legs to get past you. And then what I combine that with usually is a punch, the, what I call the, the chin rest area, just between the testicles and the bum hole. Bang. So then you've, you've, you've penetrated and you've decimated at the same time. A firm sounding technique. I think the art 
to the sport, of course, is once your opponent has been destroyed mentally and physically, he still has to be strong enough to be able to get back up and then join your team. Well, that's what sorts out the the wheat from the chaff. There's a camaraderie there. There's a camaraderie, I think, between There's an unspoken bond, Dave. Mm. A powerful unspoken bond. Sometimes you can't speak, you haven't got any teeth, but I mean, there's there's a bond there. Clearly, um, uh, head injury is an issue that can occur. Yeah, so I mean, it's very important when you're playing British Bulldogs to well, put first of all, I was going to say put safety first, but put put your country first, yeah. and then put you, put your safety second. These days, I I wouldn't be p- playing so much, but I'd definitely be uh, on the sidelines watching. Well, this is the thing; it's also a spectator sport. I think I think the spectator aspect of it has been overlooked over the years. I can see in my mind's eye why not put eighty five thousand people in Wembley Stadium and watch two teams of Britain's finest. I mean, that really is an event to behold. And I think it, it would draw in a bigger crowd worldwide than perhaps Premiership football. It's pure sport. There's none of this rolling around the place like the Europeans do, you know? I think you're right. It's it's a very British event. It's a very British event. But I think you could export that and perhaps take some of that British culture to the masses, the appeal of seeing, you know, two teams of 100 young French boys in a, in a, in a, a stadium in, in France would be equally as enthralling. Stade Francais, 200 French lads, instead of wearing a yellow jacket and setting fire to cars, you know, and being a pain in the ass and ruining Euro Disney for everybody, celebrate our British heritage. Yeah. Make them play British Bulldogs and make sure it's called British Bulldogs as well. Yeah, and uh, Le Bulldog Francais doesn't have the same. No, not on my watch. It's definitely got an appeal. Um, I think if you could live stream... It kicks the tits out of snooker. Even a a sport such as snooker has some high stakes investors, um, cigarette brands, alcohol brands. Who doesn't remember the the glory days of the Embassy World Snooker Championships? Who doesn't remember the glory days of the John Player Special Racing Team? The thick smog of cigarettes hanging over the, the crowd. Bring it back. The concept of introducing smoking to a team of... A hundred young boys in an indoor arena would really ramp up the atmosphere, I think, add an extra depth of excitement. And kids today miss out on that. They don't have that. Too busy on their bloody Nintendos. Indeed. And I I think this is where it's important because the youth of today seem to have lost contact with reality, whereas whereas here they will face reality hard and fast in the face. The kids today are the worst kids there have ever been. The attitude now is disgusting and they want, 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 but they won't give. My next door neighbour's grandson has just got off to university and he's come back a completely different person. He's completely changed the way he looks. He's changed his attitude. Now he's five foot four and he's commanded that his parents replace the sofa with a smaller version so that he looks bigger. They, he's asked that his double bed is replaced with a single bed, proclaiming that he now identifies as a giant. He's asking to be called Goliath. Now, that is ridiculous. In my day, you didn't refer to yourself as a giant unless you were over six foot five. And that's a fact. Yeah. Well, we can all remember seeing, uh, I think it's Robert Persian Wadlow on Record Breakers. Incredibly big man. Eight feet, eight feet 11. Now imagine if he'd turned up on record breakers and said, no, sorry, I'm I'm a small person. Imagine that. Dwarf. Can you Shocking. even say dwarf now? I don't know. I don't, I don't think you can. I think you have to say small person, which is fine if you're a small person, which is what my next door neighbor's grandson is, a small person. Yet mm. he continuously tries to identify as a giant. That is university in a nutshell to me. Shocking. Have you ever met a single person that's been to university that's doing anything useful? No. Although the doctor is looking at... Uh, uh, what's their number one job? Keep you alive. And what happens to everybody? They die. Yeah. So in my books, they're idiots learning medicine. Exactly. And this is the opportunity for those sorts of namby-pamby people to get involved with a real back-breaking sport. And it's a very, it's a very powerful sport. But, I mean, would you say it would appeal to the youth of today? Is it something that you think you could get young people involved with? Or is this something strictly for the older man who's perhaps living in the past? No, 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 very much. A, I've always got one eye on the future. I mean, if you think of the problems with the inner cities today, there's all these young ne'er-do-wells running around with nothing to do, causing trouble, causing a, a, hoo, a hoo-ha, if you will. Yeah. What better way to channel those young lads' aggressive tendencies than into a game where, you know, we get them off the street, or unless you want to play it on the street, and they can beat each other senseless, really, almost within an inch of their lives. 
Is it possible this could become a mixed event? Could this be something that young boys and girls could take part in together? Or, or In one respect, people say that I'm traditionalist. But on the other hand, I'm all about equality. I think women are equally as strong, certainly mentally as men. I mean, I, got, I had six sisters and they used to beat the piss out of me. So I yeah. think mixed British Bulldogs is uh, certainly something that I could envision. If we can get them into the church halls and we can get them playing British Bulldogs on a regular basis, we could change the country. Almost like a national service. Indeed. Now, if people are listening are interested in joining a, a yeah. um, British Bulldogs League, uh, could you tell me, is there is there an official body, a website or, or a point of contact they could they could reach out to and perhaps join up? I know you're starting at, at the church. So yeah, I don't, I'm not a big believer in, in, in the computers, Dave. I'll be honest with you. I think they are part and parcel of the problem. We have got a P.O. box, so you can P.O. box me. Uh, right. It's Dom. Yeah. Got it? Dom. Parrot. Yeah. Double R, double T. Double R, double T. Yep. Yeah. P.O. box 46. Box 46, right, yep. Yeah. Nantwich. Nantwich. And that'll get to me, you know. And then if you, if you want me to reply to you, then uh, if you can close a stamped address envelope, I'll send you a little note back. So you have other interests as well. You're also um, a, a bit of a poet, um, a bit of a performer, and a bit of a, a bit of a singer. Yeah. Um, and I, I've heard rumour that you are in a now. If I get this right, if I check my notes, a a limp biscuit tribute act. Yeah. I think a great way, to, a great way, to perhaps to end the interview could be you could sign out with a, an advert for British Bulldogs. And then end on a musical number with a with a, a song by the, uh, the man Limp Biscuit. Well, just like I said, please get in touch with the PO Box if you're interested in in resurrecting British Bulldogs and standing up for what you believe in, uh, which is a strong strong Britain globally. Yeah. Uh, and in the words of the great Fred Durst, "Well, I know you'll be digging British Bulldogs right here. L I M P Biscuit is right here. People in the church, put your hands in the air because if you don't care, and we don't care." Keep rolling, 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 rolling. Keep rolling, 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 rolling. That sort of, very much that sort of. Very good, very good. And and, and on top of the uh, British Bulldogs, where will you? Where could we see you performing uh, in your uh, Limp Biscuit tribute band? We're doing a gig in the RAOB, the Royal and Ancient Order of Buffaloes Club, um, yeah. in Prestwick, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Well, um, Don, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you today. And I think we've all learned something um, about not just a, a sport that's on its way back in a big way, all thanks to you, but also we've learned about ourselves somehow. So I'd like to say, Don Perrett, thank you very much. And um, I can't think of anything else, so that that, that should be fine. Th thank you, David. I think No problem. Thank Thank you. Don Perrett, thank, thank you. Thank you, David, for the, for the offer of talking to you. Thank you. And thank you to the listeners. Thank you indeed to and the listeners. Thank you. If people want to, well, I've already said it, but, you know, just thank thank you for listening to any anyway anyway. And thank you, Don Perrett, for taking time to speak so openly about um, a fantastic sport that hopefully is on the up and up from, from here well, thank onwards. you, Dave. Just, I'd also just like to thank my, um, my wife, uh, I mean, she left me 20 years ago, but I'd uh, just like to thank her for all the for all the spare time that I've got now. And does she have a name or? Uh, we, I don't like to use a name. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you, Don, for uh, again taking time to talk so openly about the sport. Absolute pleasure. And any time, Dave, you want to come along and w watch or take part, you know, then um, or any of your listeners, I think that she can't thank you enough. Well, I, I equally, I, I can't thank you enough for this as well i think i think the the mutual appreciation here is is on a if it was being measured it would be a 10 or on a scale that went from from 1 to 10 and thank you again well thank you for that thank you that's very kind of you to say that thank you for that. thank thank you so much for thank for you. being involved and you know thank, thank well, you well just for, thanks for the appreciation and thank you for you know for having the humility to thank me thank you for well, that. I, I'd like to thank you for for thanking me because I think it's it's these days people can't accept a compliment. I'd like to thank you for complimenting me, and I'd like to compliment you with, with a with a big thank you and a big a thanks with a with capital letters if it was on a keg, Ca big pink capital letters that said thanks with balloons on the sides 
and and the candles that don't go out when you blow them novelty joke candles that they keep lighting back up if if you were closer than, and i had time I, i'd get that cake made to say thank thank you i would eat every slice of it and and when i finished it i would say thank you for what why you made the cake and the effort you've made and, well I, and I, and after you you'd eaten that cake and, and thanked me i would i would thank you for eating an entire cake because that shows dedication and, and, and true friendship. And I would say thank you for for eating that cake and allowing me to, to make that cake for you. And I would say thank you because of that. And that, that would be a, a really big thanks. If I could fly up one of those inflatable balloons you have above a carpet shop, if I could fly that in the air over your house and just put on the side of that, thank you, Dave, in big letters, then I'd like to do that for you. And I, I would just like to thank you for that. And I would like to say that if, if I had access to some American um, four by four trucks, the Bigfoot style, I would get enough of them to write the word thank you in, in, in the floor by parking them all in the shape of the word thank you. And then I would buy a drone and I would fly the drone up above where the monster trucks are looking down. And then I would, I would film that and then I would upload it to YouTube and I would make that video go viral and, and it would have your name on it. So people would know that's how much I would like to thank you. So thank you, Don Perrett. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode of Meet the Street, remember to like and subscribe on iTunes or your favourite podcast provider. Follow me on Twitter at Plimpton David and join my Facebook page at Meet the Street One. And if you're really feeling generous, you can donate a small fee via ko-fi.com forward slash meet the street. Every penny helps. Until next time, goodbye. Jill, I've done it. You can use the spare room for the washing now.